Well, this evening I'm going to be concluding my uh, series on the abundance of God's salvation, and I want to look at this text in the, the third chapter of Ephesians. I, I apologize, I, I meant to tell her uh, verses 14 through 21. I want to begin at the beginning of this prayer um, uh, of the Apostle Paul that he ex expresses for the Ephesians. I'm going to go ahead and read that text again. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ with passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen. Now, this is a prayer that the Apostle expresses for the Ephesians that they might see the uh, abundant, all-encompassing nature of the kingdom, that they might grow up into the fullness of what God has intended for them to be in Christ Jesus. Yes. Now, at the beginning of this prayer, he says that he would grant them according to the riches of his glory. Now, now this alone is an encouraging request. Yeah. That, um, that this is something that ought to make us confident because of the, the God that we are talking about here. This is a God that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And we notice here that he didn't say um, that he would grant you out of the riches of his glory. Now that, that alone would be, would be a good request, that he would grant you out of the riches of his glory. But he said that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Well, that's a different request. Yes, amen. If a millionaire was to give you a dollar out of his riches, that would be one thing. But if he would give to give you something according to his riches, now that's a different story. Yeah. Amen. Uh, so that's that, that's in accordance or in measure with the riches yeah. of his glory. Amen. That's much better. We're talking about God here. Amen. So who has more of an abundance of glory to enrich you with? So in times when you're feeling a little bit poor, uh, you, you just remember this, that you have free access to the riches of his glory. So, so don't, don't live as a beggar when, when you got millions in the bank, so to speak. That's what, that's what he's telling the Ephesians here. Uh, you have, he's going to grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. See, not only have you you've been given these riches, but in accordance with these riches, this glorious provision of divine favor and blessing, uh, you, you've been given this new man and this the spirit of God within you to guide you into all truth. It's no wonder that the apostle expresses at the end of this chapter that the nature of God and the way that he does, that, that he's able to, to do this exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. What, what he has provided for us is exhaustive in its scope and in, in his effectiveness. It's evident in his prayer that the apostle recognizes the nature of salvation and what is needed for us to, to make it through this world to that world without end. Amen. Yes, amen. Well, this is something that is needful because our inner man is not the only man that we have. Our other man is very much still there, and it would seek to gain the dominance very eagerly were not our inner man as strong as it ought to be. And the old man, when it's crucified, it can only threaten and tempt, but when it comes off the cross, it's every bit as strong as it was before it got put up there. So this, this is what the apostle asked for the believers at Ephesus because he recognizes this liability. He recognizes that if this were to happen, that this, this would be, they would be every bit as strong as it was when it came down. So then he continues, that you being rooted and grounded in love, he might be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the, the length and the depth and the height thereof. Now, love in the kingdom is not, as it were, a fleeting feeling. 
It, it is something that has a deep course. It, it's something that must be maintained and kept. In fact, the text suggests that if, if it's not maintained and if it's not kept, if you're not rooted and grounded, if you're fickle and you're wavering in your affection, that you can't comprehend with all saints the, the dimension that we're speaking of. The, the kingdom of God, it has a dimension to it. It has depths and it has heights that must be plumbed. You won't get very, high, very far in the kingdom trying to maintain a two-dimensional view of things. At some point in time, you have to see the scope of it all. You, you've got to throw your anchor fast into the depths of truth and see how deep it goes to be able to, to be stable in times of trouble. Amen. It is this shallow view of things that causes people to fall in times of adversity. As I was thinking about this, it reminded me of something that Brother Al said a few renewals ago, that you, you just you can't live on thumbnail views of Jesus. You, you, you've, at some point in time, you have to see the scope of things. You've got to be able to see the scope of the kingdom to be able to, to continue. Amen. And so he continues, To know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all of the fullness of God. And, and uh, there's two texts here that I, I want to talk about in conjunction with this. For in him, that talks about Christ, dwelleth all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And in, earlier in Ephesians, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So if all the fullness can be found within Christ and he is filling his body with that fullness, only the, the body in aggregate at the end when he is, he's presented it to himself as his spotless bride will be able to completely contain his fullness. But in the present, each individual member is able to be filled to his measure as he is in Christ. So as the text in Colossians puts it, you are complete in him. And as the earlier text in Ephesians 1 puts it, in this, you are fulfilling your role as a member of the body of Christ. In our text, as we are looking at this evening, only as you know experientially the love of Christ that passes knowledge, something that can't be taught or transferred intellectually, you will be filled with your measure of the fullness of God that's contained in Christ Jesus. Uh, he expressed it this way in John when he said, And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. Amen. Now to this phrase right here is what really struck me the most. And I've, I've, I've said this a lot during this series because it's, it's really affected me. And unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now, I thought about this, and this is a clarifying statement about the nature of God that we are speaking of here. And it, it is an evident of the intimate fellowship that the apostle had with the Heavenly Father. So he could have just ended the chapter by saying, Glory be to God and the church by Christ Jesus. But he wants to clarify this point. He wants for the Ephesians to see the grand nature and the scope of the purpose and the will of God, the sufficiency of his purpose and of his provision. He, he wants to underline this. You know, in our generation, we always hear men say, God can bless your finances and God can heal your body and God can give you a good marriage and a good family. And, and, and honestly, if, if you look and see what the majority of people say about this text, almost without reservation, you will find it applied in this way. Whatever you ask for, God can give it to you. And no matter how high your hopes and dreams are, God is able to make them happen and on and on. And I'm not here to argue that God can't do that. The question is, is that what we ought to be thinking of when we think of the work of God? Yes, 
We're not really talking about the same kind of thing here. We're on a whole other level when we're talking about this here. Think If you think of the highest, most difficult, most impossible to accomplish, most incredibly blessed high thing that you can imagine, and multiply that by exceeding abundantly above, and that's the ability of our God. Amen. You can't imagine this high. You can't even think this high. That's what we're talking about. That is the point of this text. I think the apostle used three superlatives here to really drive the point home. So when we think about God, when we praise God, let's give him the glory that he's due. Let's always strive to look at it from the highest level. I mean, don't, don't misunderstand me. We sure are thankful that God heals the sick. And we're, we are very thankful that God gives us the things that we need in the present circumstances that we have in the earth. But we are more thankful that he did and that he's going to do for us what we could not even imagine that we needed. And that what we could not even know that we needed had it not been revealed to us. What only he was able to do. And the, the work of redemption for mankind is the paramount example of this ability of God. What he did in sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin was something that we could have never imagined. Something that we could have never even thought to ask for. We didn't even know that we had need of it, let alone have the wisdom to come up with the solution to ask for. This divine provision, it was exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Not only has he rescued us from a most certain doom, he has made us accepted in the beloved. He's given us a new heart and a new mind. He's been given us to be made partakers of the divine nature. He's been given us his Holy Spirit to live within us, to guide us and direct our paths. He's given us an inheritance that's undefiled and um, incorruptible that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for us. That is the ability of our God to do. So when we talk about the things that God can do for us, we're talking about things on this kind of a level. So it is for this reason that our expectation of what we receive from him must not be driven by what we want to have given to us, but what, what, what he has determined to give us. Yeah. 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 Our expectation then must be driven by the promises of God. Amen. So we cannot even think as high as God is willing to and plans to bless us. So to primarily live unto him with our dreams and our aspirations in the forefront of our minds is the highest form of folly. You can't even dream this high. You can't possibly think of something this blessed. It's for this reason that we make the most progress in the kingdom when the will of God, when we make, this, when we make his will our desire. We can be sure that our desires will be fulfilled in every way if we, if we make the will of God our number one priority. This is why we're taught to think of things in concert with the will of God. And this is why we're not to be distraught when things don't go the way that we had wanted or expected them to. It is God that works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure, right? Right? And this is why we can affirm that all things work together for good for them that love God and who are called according to his purpose. And this is why so many people in our generation fall to pieces when they have trials and troubles in their lives because they have built their lives upon faulty ideas about God. God is not here primarily to give you what you want. His agenda flies on the bander of exceeding abundantly above. So it, it very well may be that sometimes things don't work out the way you expected they would, but you can trust that however it works out in the end, it will be better than you could have planned it out anyways. Amen. So he, he exceedingly abundantly above according to the power that worketh in us. Now this is a... a, a the same power that is able to bless beyond our current capacity to even imagine or desire is at work within us. 
So he's not doing a work outside of us or independent from our own persons, but we're actually workers together with him in this. Now, this is a blessed thought. Now, this divine nature that you've been made a partaker of in Christ Jesus is, as it were, the agent of God that works within you to effect this change. Now, we're talking about the same thing that he was talking about when he revealed the mystery that was kept secret from the foundation of the world, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In fact, he talks this, about this mystery again earlier in the same chapter of Ephesians. I think that this will be perfect to lead us into the last portion of our text. He says in Ephesians 3, 9, and 10, And to make men all see what is the fellowship of this mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God, who created all things by Christ Jesus, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So the wisdom of God is being seen in this, that these creatures who were once sinful, who were once aliens, who were once enemies of God, they've been changed, they've been transformed from within, and even while they're still in bodies of flesh, they've been made partakers of his very righteousness. They've been made partakers of his very nature. They've been given his very spirit and are actually glorifying him in the midst of a cursed world. So unto, at the very end here, he says, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. Now this statement is not merely the apostle glorifying um, what he is able to see about the Lord and how he's worthy of glory because of the work that he has done in the church, although it is that, but it is actually a statement of fact. It's a summary of the display of the wisdom of the glory that God is deriving from the creation of the church in the present. God is being glorified in the church by Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. From the moment that the Lord ascended back to glory and began his ministry and the apostle as the apostle and high priest of our profession and as our intercessor on high, he has been glorifying God and his work as in the church. In every age since then, there has been this testimony in the earth of those who are in him. And the principalities and powers looking on have been beholding in them the manifold wisdom of God and working out salvation in the earth. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to make some comments on this this phrase, world without end, because this has been an intriguing thing to me. This is the manner of the kingdom, world without end, ever expanding, ever increasing, never passing away, never showing signs of decay or aging. And in the present, this is an arresting consideration. It is something that is foreign to everything that we have ever known or experienced. In this world, everything has an end. In this present world, anything that has ever had a beginning or has ever at one time in any sense new becomes old and perishes. The very existence of time and passage of time marks this degeneration and decay as the world goes on. The very idea of something that doesn't pass away is intriguing, to say the least. And in Revelation 21, these words here express it so well. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Those words right there are just incredible. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And these words of God, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are all passed away. Behold, I make all things new, all things new, And I wanted to make this um, comparison. I think I did this in the men's meeting a while back, but it was so good I had to do it again. It's and and this is um, what the the church is going to be on that day, and this is in the fifth chapter of Ephesians. It says, "Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that He might present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing." Now, now this here is the definition of spot. 
Now, this is a small circumscribed mark caused by disease or allergic reaction, right? Or a rounded mark or stain made by a foreign matter. So there's not the church. You're not going to be able to tell by outside appearance that there's anything foreign about them. There's not going to be any disease. There's not going to be any kind of allergic reaction to them in the world to come. Holy, stainless, spotless. Now, the definition of wrinkle is a small furrow or crease in the skin as from aging or frowning. There's not going to be any of that there. There's not going to be any aging. There's not going to be no frowning. And then the second definition is a temporary slight ridge or furrow on the surface. There's not going to be any temporary things there, no slight ridge. It's going to be without spot or without wrinkle or and the last category is or any such thing. Amen. It reminded me of in Revelation 21, it said, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. So that's that world without end, nothing that defiles. That's, that's going to be entirely holy. Amen. But having said this, when we talk about world without end, it's not simply that it'll be void of defiling and filthy things, but that it'll be a place where holy and good things can abound and increase. Yeah. It will not only be a place where there's no decay and there's no decrease, but there is infinite increase and growth. Not just a world that never ends, but a world that never stops increasing. And in Isaiah chapter 9, when um, uh, it talks about um, the, the ch for unto us a child is born, it says the prince of peace of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with just judgment and with judgment, justice from henceforth even forever. See, this is, this is the nature of the world to come. This is the nature of world without end. And in the second chapter of Ephesians, he talks about that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. This is what we have to look forward to, an eternity of these things continuing forever. And we're not having any hindering influences. This increase will continue and continue. So in, in, in conclusion, brother, and I was able to see so much more in this series how... The, how abundant our salvation is in Christ Jesus. How it's not eternal life is not just life forever. It is eternal life. It's a life on a whole nother level. Yes. Well, thank you, brethren.